welcome to our uh, first event of 2014. Uh, we're delighted that all of you could be here with us. Uh, it's obviously a testament to the topic and to the wonderful panelists that we've put together. Um, that all of you are here, and we just simply couldn't be more delighted. Uh, we launched the Center for Digital Transformation um, almost two years ago. March 1st, 2012 was our kickoff event. Some of you were actually here, so thank you for, for staying with us over the course of this journey that we've had. And when we launched in 2012, we did it on a hope. We just thought we had figured out something that was interesting. We thought the business community and our local stakeholders would be interested. And we weren't quite sure if anybody would show up for our signature, our, our, our kickoff conference, which was on March 1st, 2012. Uh, I think all of us had scars from that event, from all the, the, the internal scars, from all the distress that we had. And a lot, a lot of people showed up, and you guys have stayed with us over the course of the last couple of years. So, so thank you very much. Um, the Center for Digital Transformation exists um, to help companies navigate the digital environment. So how do we become more digital? You know, and, and, I, and I think about this, and I'm gonna do this in a nonpartisan way. Um, so let's think about what, is the, what are the big stories in the news in the last yes. month or two, last week, I so What comes to mind when you think about stories like, what's getting a lot of attention? I'll give you my favorite. Healthcare, Obamacare, right? So you think about this for a second. How did the president, who ran one of the most sophisticated technology campaigns that has ever been run in the US, completely bomb with the rollout of Obama, with, with the technology piece of, 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 of this? And, and this is your signature initiative, right? And, you're, and, and, and the technology is not being delivered correctly. Um, so, so, so to, to think about that for a second. And then before we all kind of pat our chests and think how great we all are, every company in the world is dealing with this in some form of view. If you want another government story, look at kind of what the NSA and, and the wiretapping story has done. And you start thinking about, you know, there are some huge issues. Then. What else? Target. Think about how much market capitalization they have lost as a result of the data breach. Who's next? Neiman, who, who was next? Neiman Marcus. Fewer shoppers in Neiman Marcus. Uh, but still, 110, 120 million customers at Target have had their, 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 their privacy compromised. There are 300 odd million people in the US, many of whom are kids. That's pretty much everybody with a credit card in the US who's had, everybody shops at Target, right? And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this is important stuff. And, and you can just go example after example after example of companies that actually make the transition. And, and then if you, if you take the positive side, the wonderful companies like, like Amazon, right? How many of you saw the 60 Minutes episode where uh, they're gonna deliver stuff to you by drone? <laughs> pretty amazing, right? And you know, we think about that that's pretty far away. In other countries, actually, they are already doing it. They can start thinking about geosurveillance, dust cropping, whatever. There's all kinds of kind of interesting uses uh, for drones. So it's, it, 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 the world's getting really interesting. How many of you know that Amazon actually has a job title called Chief Algorithmic Officer? Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Which of your companies has this job title? Anyone? Now think about that for a second. What is what are they really saying when you say I have a chief algorithmic officer? What they're saying is they think the technology is important enough that every process that could probably be automated into an algorithm should be. And they are looking extensively for ways to talk about to discover new forms of efficiency. Uh, and it is it's an absolutely fascinating. So you know we we all should be coming off the Christmas season. I'm going to ask you a slightly personal question. How many of you are more stressed during the Christmas season than before the than then? You know, especially this big, wonderful relaxation season, and everybody comes back and they look so exhausted. Um, so, so that's. But the reason I bring that up was because during Christmas, we're shipping packages to each other, and you just go. To, if you're me, you go to the UPS store and you take whatever sizes of boxes they have, and you find sort of a box that matches. And you, you, so, and sometimes you say, oh, "That's kind of a big box for what I'm actually shipping." 
Well, Amazon even optimizes that. They have actually come up with more sizes of boxes than any other company, including UPS. So you start thinking about it, and you say, look at the potential for efficiency. So we live in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in an extraordinarily digital age, and it's only going to get more so, particularly with kind of these new forms of technology, the new forms of media. So kind of turning to the topic for today, you know, this is a social listening, right? And we've always talked about listening to our customers. Now it's important, to, so when, when was Facebook launched? When was Twitter launched? Not very long ago, so let's say, say please, 10 years ago, we just, at least, I mean, it's MySpace, whatever, you take, pick, pick whatever you want. So 10 years ago, we didn't have a need for social listening. Uh, and now, company after company, technology companies, uh, you know, like are, are, are actually building solutions for it, and we find it extraordinarily important to listen to what's being said in, in social media, in the social space about it our companies. A great example for, for pharmaceutical companies, we were asking a question in one of the other forums that we run, and we asked the question about what's happening to the balance of power in your industry as a result of technology? Which, which competitors are doing better than you guys are? And one of the companies was a pharmaceutical company, and they said, you know, we're really not worried about our competitors because we've got patents on our product. You really can't touch us. However, the FDA is watching what people are saying in social media about our product. So if there are adverse events as a result of you taking somebody's meds, it shows up in social media, right? And all of a sudden, the pharmaceutical company, which the government had no way of monitoring before, now actually does. So this whole set of issues around social listening is extremely important because where better can you find a collection of commentary about your company than out on the internet? And that's what these companies are, 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 are trying to focus on. So we are launched on this journey, which we hope to continue forever, uh, with somebody else, obviously, after some period of time. But the point is, we think these set of issues are persistent. Companies will keep needing assistance, making this transition as technology continues to evolve. And we hope to partner with all of you uh, to engage with us in conversation, to work with us on research, to come to our events, to support our events, whatever strikes your fancy. So we really look forward to partnering with all of you as we move forward. Uh, let me kind of move next to kind of um, kind of the actual agenda for today. So we're going to start with uh, let, let me make some some introductions. We're going to start with Malcolm Delea, who is the chief evangelist for NetBase Solutions, and uh, is a passionate innovator who loves being a change agent. Now that's one of the hardest jobs in the world because for those of us even within the university trying to be a change agent, it's hard. Uh, and, and and Malcolm does this for NetBase Solutions, which is a software as a service company. Uh, that uses a natural, you know, you're all familiar with natural language processing, and, and what they're basically doing is analyzing the billions of conversations out there. So Malcolm's going to kick us off, and what he's going to talk about is kind of his kind of bird's eye view of what they see as a, as a technology solutions provider and the importance of social listening. Then one of the pieces of feedback we got from all of you from, from prior uh, events is you really wanted case studies. What you asked for in, in the feedback forms that we gave you was, what does a single company actually do around a specific topic? So once we get past the ideas, how do we actually implement? And Taco Bell was very generous uh, to come forward and actually offer their kind of insights. Uh, some of them are sort of not very public necessarily, so thank you, we'll see. Uh, thank you very much for sharing kind of what it is you've learned. Um, to the folks at in and out, we're not going to report back on those at, at the office. Uh, just kidding. Um, Anyway, so Lynn Hammonds is the Director of Industry and Competitive Insights at Taco Bell and a very long-standing supporter of the center. So thank you, Lynn. Uh, Tressie Lieberman is the Director of, and, and she's an alum, I should mention, from, from the class of 98. Uh, Tressie Lieberman is Director of Digital Marketing and Platforms, comes to Taco Bell from a sister company, Pizza Hut, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, is, and then Rob Page, who is the Director of Public Affairs and Engagement. One of the things we'll find is, even though you have a common kind of social listening platform, they call it the fishbowl, you know, there's different stakeholders within a company that all need to act on and learn from the information that they get from, from the social listening platform. So uh, just one last kind of clarification. We are recording this session. Uh, for, so for those of you, if you do have a concern with being recorded, please let us know and we will 
wipe your piece of it off the present off the rec rec recording. Uh, so <coughs> with that, Malcolm, thank you so much for coming out to, to do this. We really appreciate it, Malcolm. From the oh, there we go. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Uh, let me get set up here. Here we go. Evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Malcolm DeLeo. I'm the chief evangelist at NetBase. I often joke I don't know what that means, but that's the title they gave me. So. Um, I primarily uh, work with our largest customers like Taco Bell. It's a pleasure to be speaking with them today to help implement and how you apply our social listening solution. Our social listening solution, very briefly, um, uses natural language processing, which is like when you're a kid coding sentences in English class, it understands the relationship between the words and does that at scale in real time. So it understands the difference between um, the iPhone has never been good, which is a negative statement, which is the iPhone has never been this good. Difference by one word, it understands the difference between that and does that in scale in real time. So I'm not going to talk much more about the, the system as much as about the listening market and how to think about it. But I always like to start this presentation with a question. So right now, today, how many of you trust social data to run your business? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys aren't allowed to raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many of you, when you're picking a restaurant, buying a new appliance, buying an electronic, trying to figure out where to go to vacation, trust social data to make that decision? Okay. The sad part is I've been asking this question going on three and a half years, and the ratio has not changed at all. And um, my title of my talk is How to Be a Real-Time Marketer, because it always sounds sexy, but I think it should be actually real-time understanding, which is how social media analytics can provide insight at the speed of social. It's really about how you hear, understand, and listen, not just marketing. Marketing is such a small piece of running your business that social listening can do way, way more than that. So I asked my question, and the answer to my question is always the same. This is what I call the social me uh, media cultural conundrum. It's very simple, right? Consumers trust social data to make their decisions, but businesses are still lagging behind. And it's costing businesses millions and millions of dollars every day. And you have to think about that. Again, I, I ask this question. I'm going to give five talks in the next three months. That answer will be the same everywhere I go. I even went to a social media conference once. I only got 15% of the hands. I couldn't believe it. Okay. Why has this happened? And this is the first time I'm sharing a slide. I've been writing a book about what this means for organizations now that there's been what I call a power shift. We kind of live in what we call a post-authoritative economy. And the reality that's happened over the last <clears throat> 15 years is there's modes, how people communicate, venues, the vehicles by which they communicate, and then the means, who has the money. And essentially what's happened is the individual has taken the power away from large organizations. In the past, large companies controlled radio and television. Okay, They were able to distribute it on radio shows, television shows, newspaper. They had all the money to control everything, to control the store shelf. It's over. The individuals has the means, right? We have the internet, we have mobile, right? They have the venues, Facebook, Twitter, name it. And now they have the means where David is as big as Goliath these days. And I think when you hear from Taco Bell, they're gonna tell you a little bit how that's true. This is a reality. It will cause every company that can shift its culture to manage it, and if they can't, they're gonna have huge problems going forward. So coming down a little bit, what is social listening? Everybody talks about it. If you go on LinkedIn and you look and search on social analysts on LinkedIn, you will always find a marketer. There are very few people that are actually analytics people understanding data. Most of them are saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a community manager, but it says I'm a social analyst. Those are two different things. And the reason they're two different things is there's pushing out social content and there's pulling it. So push is all about engagement, message, interaction. It's how you drive the conversation, right? Listening is the pull behind that, which is what are the insights? How am I garnering ROI off it? What's the correlation with the activities I see versus the things I do? And the reality is, as the amount of content is continuing to climb day by day, minute by minute, you need both. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this slide changed about six months ago. Maybe it'll change soon. It used to be 80-20. It's probably 70-30. And by that, I mean only about 30% of the market really cares about building a social listening program because they're not really sure how or what it means at this point. But you need to do it because there's been a litany of examples. 
and Vijay brought them up, I think a great one is, is uh, the pharma industry. They can't look on social for their data, but everybody's talking about it, and the FDA can. Talk about an antiquated regulation. I think people should want to know that, right? It really goes back to what I think is one of the pivotal moments in social listening. Does anybody remember when the Gap put out its new logo in, I think it was September of 2010? That lasted one week. It was driven by actually the design community, not consumers. They made mistake after mistake doing it. And actually, no, you know, no, bad, no PR is bad PR. They actually got a lot of attention. But there's a series of individual events that occurred. Okay? So this is why pull's important. So if pull's important, how do we apply it to our business? And this is a way I kind of like to do it, and I try to narrow it down little by little. When you think about social listening, we like to talk in terms of use case. What are the types of things that you can do with the social data to help make better decisions? So for instance, for trending or product innovation, you can look for a lead user insight. Find out what somebody's <clears throat> saying that maybe you didn't know. So I, I'm a chemist by training. I used to develop cleaning products for Clorox, right? I started my career doing consumer research, you know, sitting in focus groups and watching people clean their bathrooms. I can tell you the reason I'm standing here is because I got tired of doing it. When I saw social data six or seven years ago, this is a great example. Two, brand health or competitive intelligence. And I asked this at all these market research conferences. How do you do market research on your, on your uh, competitors? Oh, well, we do that. We have a survey. Yeah, and you have what, like one question? Right, you can see everything about your, your competitors now. I like to say the suggestion box is now public and your market research wears no clothes, right? Number three, product launch, campaign tracking. If you can evaluate your campaign before, during, and after, isn't that useful? Instead of waiting six weeks to find out how it went? Or crisis or risk management, getting a 360 degree view of the problem. If you can do all these things by polling, it allows you to have a more informed product strategy. Be proactive in targeting your message. With all this data, you need a laser rifle, not a shotgun, right? Improve your engagement effectiveness. How do you engage in a campaign? How do you market on the fly? How do you move the marble on that? And lastly, how do you use knowledge to respond appropriately? So as you dig even deeper into that problem, in social listening, one of the great challenges we face as a vendor is there are many people out there that are really interested in just counting numbers. And you can't do that. You have to go deeper than that. You have to go beyond the how much. You know, how much is about data. Why is about insight? I might know things change. For example, if you get 1,000 likes on Facebook, is that good or is that bad? If people are talking about this, what are they talking about, right? How much tells you it's changing? Why helps you understand, right? How much is what you see? Why is what you believe? You know, at the end of the day, we're all business people, and a lot of business people do things on gut. Yeah, there's some people out there that run everything on numbers, and those numbers make information, but that information has ultimately come to us. If you're stuck at just looking at numbers and missing the opportunity to look at the whys, you're not listening effectively. You're not bringing your knowledge to the problem. And what that leads to is how to think about your listening program. I like to say there's tool focus or use cases that measure changes, things like how much am I mentioned? What influencers can identify? What are the number of conversations? What's my engagement rate? These are tool-focused use cases. And NetBase, we're very, very focused on driving to hard ROI and driving what I call process-focused use cases. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but social customer care or crisis management and issue tracking. Taco Bell will talk about some of these things. Real-time analysis. How about M&A? My first experience in social listening it was a huge success. It was working at Clorox. I worked with the M&A group because they were getting ready to spend $900 million on a brand, and the entire leadership team was simply using the products at home, and they had no way to do research in two weeks. How are you gonna get the information that way? These are all places where you can drive hard ROI for your business. This to me, though, is the most important slide. It's the language that drives almost every conversation I have. It's, the, it's, it's kind of like my, the bane of my existence. Like I said, um, Jay mentioned I'm, I'm a change agent at heart. I just happen to hang my hat in social media. I believe in culture, and I believe culture drives the best things and drives the most innovation. I mean, culture can be very much about business. What I want to say here is when it comes to social listening, you buy a tool, but you need to use that tool to build a process that ultimately your culture will be able to absorb, adopt, and change. I work across every vertical, across all industries, and this is always true. The companies that have gotten their culture to work differently and raise their hand 
and say, yes, yeah, social data is different. You know, I can run my business on it in it. They're having much greater success than those who say, well, how much does the tool cost? And does it have this feature? Does it have that feature? It's only when you start applying it and using it to make to drive your culture that you're going to get the types of rewards you're all looking for that will eventually get you to raise your hand. So I don't like to just talk at a thousand feet. I kind of like to do my, my or ten thousand or a hundred thousand feet. I like to start by saying, you know, here's the market and here's what it's about. But ultimately, let me show you some examples, and I'm going to do some media-based examples um, to give you an understanding of how the data can start to become valuable. Okay. So the first one is advertising effectiveness. And this came from um, a sales cycle I was in, where it's kind of a funny story. Um, I went to meet with A&E, and they looked at me as I'm getting ready to do this demo for them, and they said, we just did something with Duck Dynasty with the movie The Purge. Show us that. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, uh, you know, I had to do it on the fly. And it turned into a very interesting use case, and I'm going to share that with you. Um, the question was, can social data help us understand the effectiveness of this advertising campaign? They, this show had an exclusive advertisement for this new movie that was coming out. They wanted to see, did anybody care? So the approach we used was look for change in volume. Yes, it's kind of, gen, you know, kind of this measurement based. Understand the emotional response, but check for community absorption. Hmm, what's that? So what you're looking at here in this data is, this is out of our system, but what you're looking at is across a year's worth of content, the blue line is the number of mentions and the blue area is the number of impressions. And you can see pretty clearly when the, when the movie launched in June. Well, they told it, but if you look back in the pre-campaign, there's kind of two very large spikes which you cover down here. And I'm looking at the movie The Purge, understanding how people feel or what they say about the movie The Purge. And there's a huge spike on April 24th. And I'm sitting in that room, and they go, April 24th, that's when we did it. And I went, oh, good gosh. So, so, so I drill down, and our system allows you to actually go down into 15-minute time intervals. And lo and behold, much to my you know, happiness. At 10 o'clock when that show's on, there are 7,000 sound bites talking, about, talking uh, about the purge, a huge spike, exactly when you're supposed to see it. And if you look across those dates, it's the biggest spike going on. Nobody questioned it. And our system allows you to get the emotion out. So people are saying, hey, it's good. Hey, it's awesome. So fortunately, we were able to show them, you did this ad, people were responding. But we wanted to take it a step further. One of the technologies that we have in development is being able to use, to be able to look at what the followers of something are talking about. So I have a million people that follow my show. What do they talk about? And we're able to figure that out using our system. And so one of the experiments we did, and again, this is experimental, but just to get your mind thinking, well, think about it. I have Duck Dynasty and a million point two followers you know, headed in one direction, and they cross section with this, this ad. One would think, do any of them start talking about it? So we actually dug into the system. We were able to show prior, there's no chatter about this movie. Afterward, there's about 2,500 sound bites. Now remember, there were 7,000 sound bites that day. That represents a third of the people in Duck Dynasty actually talking in some way about this movie. Imagine the possibility of being able to do affinity analysis. Who's talking about two things at the same time, segmented in time? Now you start to talk about how you drive your advertising dollars. So this is one example. I have two more. This is a fun one. Um, AMC is a customer of ours. And they are still, as many companies, trying to figure out the best way to use uh, our technology. And we convinced them to let us live monitor the premiere of Breaking Bad in its final season. Huge event for them. And as you know, it's quite really unique in the media business because Breaking Bad has its show. And then one hour later, they sandwich a show called Low Winter Sun in. And then they have their talking bat. And in, in, in one of the challenges in media is they record the shows, they play the shows. You can't really change the shows. But this is a case where they have some reality live going on with the show. And they said, well, what if we listen during the show to see what we can do when the live show's on? So we searched for in-flight insights. We segmented and tracked the social buzz. And we monitored brand health and talent to see what could we learn. So, why did they do this? Like, again, it's a method that can help you uncover many key insights quickly and efficiently. And what I'm showing you here again is the same chart. And the whole point is to say we can see the spike when the show is on. We can see the spike when the, the after show is on about an hour later. So the first thing was, were there any celebrities watching? I have a program where I'm going to have live an hour later and I'm going to bring celebrities on my show. 
I don't know who's watching it, right? So I took a look at, for them, at before, after, and the next day to say, who are the biggest influencers watching this? Again, this is not a, um, this is not the, this is not the process-based use case as much as the other, but it was kind of interesting and important, right? So the day of the show, Adam Levine, 135, puts his first tweet out about this. Three minutes before it shows, you got Rihanna talking about that she's binge watching. These are big stars with lots and lots of followers, right? An hour later, you got Tony Hawk talking about spoilers. My favorite, we had to use your Zoolander picture, of course. You have Ben Stiller making a reference around Quatloos, which is the Star Trek thing. Even Ellen DeGeneres the next day is thanking everybody for not spoiling what happened on the show. So what's the insight? We could see some major stars watching our program, and the insight for them is, okay, I know immediately who's watching, I have these programs that come after, well, maybe these are people that would want to come on my show. Very basic insight, right? Second one, this one was very fascinating. So we have the ability to theme, look at all the data about people talking about Breaking Bad, and then theme it down to different characters. And so we just, from again, from a mentions perspective, during the show, the big huge surprise was Jesse was talked about 50% more than Walt, the main character. And the action they took on this one when they saw that, which was surprising to them, is they had Aaron Paul live tweet in following events, following episodes, because they knew people wanted to hear from him. So during the show, he was live tweeting as the show was going on. This is an actual action that they took because of this. If you haven't seen it, there's a slight spoiler alert. The third one, yet, yeah, I've had people walk out of the room when I, when I show this one. Probably would cover your eyes, too. Um, so, Again, they have this program where they're going to have an interview with, with some folks about that show. So we were live watching, moment by moment, understanding what was being discussed. It was very interesting because they came to us and kind of said, here's what we want to ask, go validate it as the show's on. And we kind of came back and said, actually, here's some other questions you might want to ask that people were talking about. Now again, you know, did they take action on this right away? No, because it's a journey. But they recognized, hmm, you can actually tell me while the show's going on what people care about in live time. I could actually change my questions if I wanted to. The fourth one is, now we're on the show talking bad, Julie Bowen's on. People weren't so happy, I kind of like the one at the bottom right, that's, that's my favorite. But um, you know, if you read these quotes, essentially we could have told them that they needed to adjust how she was interacting on the show because she was, she was totally taking over the mic. And Vince Gilligan, who's the founder of the show, was on and everybody wanted to hear from him. Imagine if they had a process where 10 minutes into the first commercial break, someone comes in and says, stop talking, right? <laughs> they couldn't do that because it wasn't part of the process. So, you know, again, I worked with the AMC to develop these slides, so they recognize that understanding social media in real time can impact their process and how we have a greater viewing of their programming. So they're, they're kind of trying to figure out now, like, how do we implement this in this process? Much like I work with Taco Bell or other companies, it's, it's a journey. I would never say anybody has a silver bullet. Last example is more brand related, so I'm gonna go away, it's still about media, but it's going away from it, more about how I think about my brand. So how do I reinvigorate a nostalgia brand? The brand I'm gonna talk about is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I did this uh, as a demo, so this is one more informative to show you the power of how the data can inform you. On the, the use case around brand strategy, and it's what approaches can I take to grow my brand, and we use um, themes to slide through the noise and understand emotions as a means of response. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out when I was a kid, and it's a really neat brand. So just getting a quick overview of it, you know, there's plenty of data where people feel very positive with passion, which is something else we're able to do. Look at the difference between like and love, dislike and hate. And if you look at what people are generally talking about when it comes to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you see a lot about the movie, that's Michael Bay. People say they're gonna watch it. But what was really interesting is when we kind of looked at where people talked about it, the number three place they talk about it is on some forum called thetechnodrome.com. In fact, it's 20% of the conversations around the brand. That's a lot of data coming from one forum. So we dug a little bit more into watch. And when we filter into watch and look again, it's still there. It's 13% of the data. In fact, when you look at that, the, the word cloud, on just general terms mentioned, kids comes up. And if you look at these sound bites, this is my first post, and I just found this site last night. I'm a huge fan. I grew up watching the original of the cartoon as a kid. 
You know, after I saw my fi first film in 1990, they became my favorite. There's people on this website talking about nostalgically about the brand. So I, I kind of was like, what is this thing? And it turns out that this is a forum started in 1999 specifically for fans of this brand. Now, as we know, there's probably not a ton of kids on this, this place. This is, so you have a brand that's old, and you find there's almost the same number of people posting on a specific website about it as they're talking about it on the greater web. Now, yes, they have lower sentiment and passion. I didn't dig into that. The point is, there's a huge environment which you can study and understand. So we dug into it a little more, and what we really found was fascinating. You know, if you just look, and going back up, if you just look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles alone, again, going back to the numbers, what we then did was build some themes. Remember, this is the world's biggest data pool you've ever seen. So I decided to build a topic around Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles filtered by nostalgia, using very specific terminology like when I was a kid, as a boy, growing up when I was young. Very long phrases. I was able to pull 16,000 consumers talking about it, and notice what happens to the passion for the brand. It jumps 30 points. Now, whether you know what that number means or not, that's a huge change. Then we said, hmm, what about people talking about it as my son, my daughter, my kids, my child, my granddaughter, my grandson? Now we see a raise in sentiment and passion. And what we realize is, when you filter and look at the attributes people like when you're putting kid narratives against it, favorite comes up as the big emotion that, that's expressed. And so the insight here, looking at data, I did this in my room, in my, you know, in my living room in my shorts, is I was able to take a look strategically at a brand that's trying to figure things out and say, oh my god, we have this brand, there's all these adults talking about it, they're really nostalgic about it, we have all these kids. This is an activity, perhaps, that we could do together. And so this is a recommendation you could make, for example, of how you get some out of the data. Have they done anything with this? I don't know. But the point is, I was able to quantitatively show changes in the conversation without talking to anybody in a focus group, without leaving my house, without getting on a plane, and, and do whatever I want. One of my favorite stories um, is I was working with a, with a fellow Coke who worked in the water business. And this doesn't happen very often. He asked me on a Wednesday, I have a huge meeting next week on the strategy. You know, what would you think about my business? This is when I want to know X, Y, Z. And I go off and I spend all this time developing a deck and I kind of hand it back to him and I showed him, this is the strategy I would take. I'd build a strategy for him. And he, he kind of, we're on the phone and he's looking at it and he goes, he chuckles. <laughs> I said, well, what is it? It's so funny. He said, well, that's pretty much the strategy I had in front of me. It only it took me nine months and I could hear the comma. He goes, comma. And you pretty much did it in five days. And I looked at him and I, and I responded, yes, in my, back, in my backyard in my shorts. And, and he, he laughed and he said, this is really, really powerful. This is really interesting. So when you think about social listening in conclusion, why do you want to understand in real time? Why do you want to use data like this? Number one, knowledge is power. This data is here whether you like it or not. Do not let the, the, the crowd own you, own the crowd. Companies that don't sit there, that are just sitting there, not leveraging this, are letting those around them talk about them. Two, be proactive, right? I got some proactive for you, as Justin Bieber would tell him, right? Get proactive. You can be proactive in how you run your business because the data is there. You don't need to wait six weeks. You don't wait to need to wait six months. You can do this faster, quicker, cheaper. Three. You know, I love that when I need to talk, you pretend to listen. Everybody says they want to know their consumers better. There's data upon data upon data upon data. You're not listening. You're not really engaging your customers. Your direct customers are even the ones that you don't know about. And then my favorite one is, what if I told you data aren't insights? Understanding the data is more than counting the data. You know, people always put the onus on us and say, why does your tool do this, why don't your tool do that? I look back and say, what process are you using with this tool, whether it's ours or others, and ultimately, how are you getting those people to raise their hand and say, you're right, I can run my business on social. Because I can have all the features in the world. If you're not willing to change how you think about using this data, it doesn't matter. I, I can talk to you until I'm blue in the face. So anyway, that's my pitch. <laughs> I hope you guys uh, enjoyed what I had to say. I think um, it's a pleasure to be here with Taco Bell. I've been along this journey with them, and 
You know, people ask me across the entire landscape who's doing it the best. And when you think about my tools, process, culture slide, as they're talking, think about that. They're leaders in the industry because of the way they think about it. It's an honor and privilege to be here with them. Thank you.